welcome back, everybody, to our Friday night Bible study with Advent Revival Ministries. We're glad that you've joined us. We're starting a new topic tonight, uh, the Hebrew religious calendar. can also call it the Messiah's calendar. Uh, we're pretty excited about this study. We've done it um, a few times in the past, but it's been a few years, and we uh, really uh, looked forward to this um, to help grow your personal walk with God and your knowledge of uh, what Jesus was doing when he came to this earth, when he died on the cross, when he rested in the tomb, when he resurrected the day after and ascended to heaven. We're going to go through all of this in the next, uh, we're kind of planning six to nine months on this study. Now we're 200 and uh, we're 293 pages, if I'm not mistaken, right? 293, Paul, on the syllabus. And uh, just want to say hi to everybody on Zoom. Good to see all your faces. Um, and uh, we look forward to you participating in as many studies as you can. A one-hour course on this. And we want to welcome everybody that's following us and watching this on YouTube. Thank you for your support. Um, please continue to do what you've been tasked to do. Click a button, share the gospel, make sure you subscribe and like the videos. Let's use this platform while we still have the freedom to do so in sharing God's word. This is a very easy way, and I would still call it a prosperous time to be able to do this because um, times are going to get um, a little bit tougher, a lot more tougher, we know. Actually, if, we, if you study the Bible, you know times are going to get um, perilous, as inspiration has told us. So. If you don't have a copy of the syllabus that we're going to follow, and for those of you on YouTube, in the description tab, when you click on that, Paul's put some links in there for you, okay? You can download a PDF copy of the syllabus. You can purchase one after the Sabbath, or you can email us, and uh, all that information is in the description tab. And if you need help getting a syllabus, just send us an email and uh, your name and, and address, and we'll try to help you out on all of that. So. Um, we've got a lot to cover tonight, and uh, you already see the clock ticking down, but uh, for those of you on Zoom, if you look in the chat window, you can see all the information I just discussed. Please put your comments, your questions, and uh, whatever you'd like to share in that window so we can bring it up as we go through the study. We're going to start on page three, but before we do, let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer as we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the Sabbath. We want to thank you for creating us. Uh, you love us, and we're so grateful for that, and we, we praise you, and uh, we want to honor you and, and remember what you've done for us, what you're doing for us, what you have planned for us um, on this Sabbath day that you set aside from everything that you did at creation. Thank you for sustaining us for the promise of redemption, and Heavenly Father, we just pray for forgiveness for our sins. We want to be connected with you, and we ask for protection from evil, from distraction, we need the strength that comes from heaven to obtain the victory. And Heavenly Father, we just pray for the Holy Spirit now as we study your word and that our hearts would be touched, that we would see why this is important to us as individuals, that we would have the courage to apply it to our lives immediately and share it with others. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Lesson number one, a tour of Messiah's house. Can you guess what Messiah's house is? We're going to talk about the sanctuary here. The SDA worldview, now there's a cosmic problem that Jesus solves step by step in his movements through the sanctuary. If I were to ask which of these steps is the most important, the majority of Christians would say, what do you think? They'd probably answer the cross, right? And the cross is vitally important, but just as important in solving the sin problems are all the other steps. So let's notice this. A tour of the Messiah's house, the bullet points there in the middle of page three. First, we have the camp. This is where Jesus wove a perfect robe of righteousness. Then you have the altar of sacrifice. Jesus paid the penalty for sin. The labor. Jesus resurrected to fulfill his next function. And then you have the temple itself, starting with the holy place, where Jesus intercedes for individuals, applies the benefits of the atonement. You have the most holy place where he examines the sincerity of repentance. The outer court, Jesus disposes of sin by putting it on the originator and perpetrator. And then you have 
the camp. Jesus returns to the camp to liberate his people forever. Revelation 20 calls it the camp of the saints. Now, all those sanctuary studies you've gone through, maybe those little images have popped up in your mind of the graphics you've seen on a screen or um, books that you have. So let's notice here the camp uh, with uh, John chapter 1 and verse 14. It says, Jesus came to tabernacle with us in the camp. And the word became flesh and dwelt. That's the same word for tabernacle. You see that in Exodus as well. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Nakedness was the first consequence of sin. You see that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. We cannot offer the law perfect righteousness, so Jesus came to weave a perfect robe of righteousness to cover the shame of our nakedness. Have you heard the expression, um, Jesus lived the life? And then some people say that we're supposed to, you know, and, and he did, but he lived the life that we're supposed to so we know how. Uh, to live that life. He doesn't live it so we don't have to live it. He lives it to show us how to live it. Okay, continuing on. All right, let's notice that in the camp that the slain victim and the officiating priest had to be without blemish. In Leviticus chapter 22, verses 20 through 22, we notice that it says, whatever has a defect you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow or a freewill offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. I'll continue on with Leviticus chapter 21, verses 17 through 21. And please notice uh, these words in your syllabus that are they're bold and they're underlined here, but in regards to the unblemished priest now. Speak to Aaron saying, no man of your descendants in succeeding generation who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach. A man blind or lame who has a marred face or any limb too long, a man who has a broken foot or a broken hand or is a hunchback or a dwarf or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scab or is a eunuch, no man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near to the to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect, he shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. And Paul and I had uh, discussed, uh, you know, uh, in, in preparing for this. Um, man, I think that would disqualify pretty much most of us now if you, you, you looked at the characteristics um, of and uh, the qualifications here for a priest and an unblemished priest. As we continue, we'll notice that the Passover lamb had to be without blemish. In Exodus 12, 5, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, Jesus is the lamb without blemish. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, we'll notice that Jesus is the priest without blemish. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, 
but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Next text is in Hebrews chapter 7. It should say verse 26. You can correct that in your syllabus. Uh, Jesus is the unblemished priest. So for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. And we'll notice in John 19, 6, that Pilate found no fault in him. It says, therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. So the, the work, work of Jesus, go ahead, bro. Oops, sorry. And the work of Jesus in the camp was objective. The robe he wove is available for every human being who has ever lived. Thank you for that. Now, we're going to, as we go through this study over the next few months, we will go into each one of these um, deeper and deeper, okay? This is almost, um, it's a good introductory to what we're going to be studying down the road. So I know as we kind of go through some of these verses um, today, there, we're going to spend a lot more time zooming in on each uh, perspective of the sanctuary and Christ and what the religious calendar, Messiah's calendar, or the Hebrew feasts, that word feast kind of can turn people off if they hear the word feast. So, um, but the feasts are a calendar, you know, and it's very important to understand uh, the ceremonial uh, feast that took place and how they were fulfilled with Christ. And we're going to deal in the syllabus with other questions as we get an understanding first of, of uh, what's true from the word of God. We will deal with the questions of, do we keep the feasts? You know, uh, the I think the loony solar deception, you know, we're going to uh, climate change. We're going to deal with some of that um, towards the end of this study. Now, in your syllabus, feel free to study ahead, but just do it in order. Um, don't skip uh, to the last. That's not how you watch movies or TV or anything. You always start from the beginning, watch through the end. I'm not encouraging you to watch movies unless they're good nature ones or whatever, you know, but that's for you and your household to, to work on. Um, but I don't, uh, I, I want to remind you that we have to build a foundation first. And that foundation is the sanctuary. And if you've never studied the sanctuary before, you're going to see that it's the very foundation to everything on what the Seventh-day Adventist church believes. So let's continue on in page five at the top, the next part. We, so Jesus wove the robe of righteousness in the camp. That's where Jesus lived his life here. Now let's go to the court. And the first thing that's, uh, that we see there is the altar of sacrifice. Jesus not only had to weave a, a robe of perfect righteousness, but he also had to resolve the problem of sin for the wages of sin is death. In Gethsemane and on the cross, every sin that has ever been committed pressed upon his soul. Think about that. And we're supposed to study the signs of the cross uh, throughout all eternity, right? But think about that when we suffer individually, when we hold on to guilt and to shame for the things that, um, that we've done and experienced, or maybe even people close to us, imagine every sin that has ever been committed pressing on your soul. The events at Gethsemane and the cross show us that sin is a terrible monster. If you want to stop sinning, just look at what it did to Jesus. So let's notice John 3, 16 here. What Jesus did, he did for the whole world. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we notice Jesus was made sin so that we could be righteousness in him. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You're going to see the plan of salvation through this study. Um, and each page we go through, uh, these are um, these are texts and a message that really tug at our heartstrings. Notice Galatians 3.13. You know, Jesus took the curse that belonged to humanity. It says, Christ has redeemed us 
from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. We'll notice that Jesus tasted death for all. In Hebrews 2.9, it says, but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So remember these that are underlined and in bold. I have all of these different color markers because I like to make my own notes and uh, even underline what's already underlined. There's some key words there that he tastes death for everyone. Notice First John 2 verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not, what? Sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. In Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's look at this quote here from Spirit of Prophecy. This is going to be Selected Messages, Volume 1. Remember, we're studying the court, the altar of sacrifice, what that means. Volume 1, page 321 of Selected Messages says, The guilt of every sin pressed its weight upon the divine soul of the world's Redeemer. The evil thoughts, the evil words, the evil deeds of every son and daughter of Adam called for retribution upon himself. For he had become man's substitute. Though the guilt of sin was not his, his spirit was torn and bruised by the transgressions of all men. And he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what Jesus did in the camp and in the court for all was for all human beings. These are some important uh, points to remember. Now, as you study this in your syllabus, you're not going to just close it up and leave it on your shelf, are you, till Jesus comes? Please don't. Please study these, uh, these lessons with your, your friends, your brethren, and other churches, uh, family members, because a lot of these uh, comments get brought up where people uh, feel um, alienated from Jesus or that they've gone too far and, and there's nothing that can be done for them or whatever it is. You can kind of plug in uh, most scenarios, but these texts and these quotes are extremely important for us. Um, but Jesus, what he did, he did for everybody. Everybody who's ever lived, his perfect life and death for sin are the benefits or gift of his atonement. But the individual sinner must what? Must claim the gift. Paul will give an illustration here um, in a little bit that, um, that I think is important. Uh, it's something that's easy to share with people. But let's look at the labor. So you're, you're, in the, you're in the courtyard. We've seen the altar of sacrifice now, and uh, we're going to uh, look over to the labor. Notice Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. The labor of regeneration represents the resurrection of Jesus in the court. By the way, where did the events take place that's represented in the court? Excuse me, the altar of sacrifice representing Jesus' death. Where did that take place? Well, here on earth. You know, Jesus uh, dying and resting in the tomb on the Sabbath and then resurrecting uh, the day after. Where does that take place? So the courtyard represents earth. Okay, so the camp takes place on earth. The courtyard takes place on earth. Notice this, Titus 3, 4, and 5. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6, 9, and 10, the priest 
had to cleanse himself from every vestige of death before he could move on to the next phase of work, which was intercession. The, resur the resurrection of Jesus was for all. Notice this in Romans 6, 9, and 10. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin. How many times? Once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Romans 4.25 says, talking about Jesus resurrecting for our justification. It says, now it, talking about the story of Abraham's justification when he believed God, was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but also for who? For us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised for our justification. Now, justification is a, a theological term. Do you know how else uh, you could define justification? Uh, forgiveness, you know, and for those of you who like to study, um, you know, a spirit of prophecy talks about this. Um, but uh, when did Jesus forgive or justify sinners? Well, at the cross, right? Notice this. First Corinthians 15 should say three through eight. If you want to correct that, it says seven. First Corinthians 15, three through eight. So why was Jesus raised? When Jesus, when did Jesus forgive or justify sinners? At the cross. Why was he raised? Notice this. A lot of people think that the death of Jesus forgave our sins. But without the resurrection, there could be no forgiveness of sin. Did you know that? Notice what Paul writes here to the Corinthians. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received that Christ died for our sins. That's Passover, by the way. According to the scriptures, and that he was buried, that's unleavened bread, and that he rose again, that's first fruits, the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, by the way, it means rock, the word means like small rock, pebble, and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me. Remember, Paul saw him on the road to Damascus as one born out of due time. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, or you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life, only we have hope in Christ, we of all men the most pitiable. We are of all men the most pitiable. So notice this. This is a pretty profound text. You have life, death, and resurrection and intercession. Which one's more important? Yeah. Was Christ's life in the camp? There you go, Paul. Was Christ's life in the camp more important than the cross? The cross more important than uh, dying and resting in the tomb on the seventh day Sabbath. By the way, it's funny when you have a lot of, um, you know, Christians kind of during this time, you have, what is it, Lent and Good Friday, and is this all the stuff before Easter, right? These, uh, when these holidays happen, I don't know, maybe somebody could nod if, um, but how come nobody, you know, uh, else, you know, respects the, that he rested in the tomb on the seventh day? You know, you see all these other things that take place um, but they they skip over, you know, the rest of the seventh day. Uh, was it important that Jesus resurrected according to Paul? He's saying if he didn't resurrect, there'd be no forgiveness for our sins. And then everything we're doing is futile. Everybody who's died in Christ have perished. And then um, we're basically uh, pitiable people because we're serving a God who's in the grave. Isn't it great that we serve a risen Savior? Does that song stick in your head, kind of sticks in mind? You know, our God is alive. That's an amazing, um, an amazing fact that people need to know. You have the perfect life in the camp, 
you have the death for sin, and then you have the resurrection. The work of Jesus in the camp and the court are the objective benefits of his atonement and are accessible to all those who claim them individually, not corporately, but individually. He fulfills each function. All right. So as we move from the court into the holy place, uh, we'll notice John 3, 16, the second half of the verse. We should all have this one memorized. Uh, you know, for God so loved the whole world, they sin his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus, by his life and death, bought the gift of salvation for every person who has ever drawn breath but only to those who receive it through faith will benefit from that. Now, here's the illustration that uh, Pastor Borgen, you know, he's the one who put all these notes together. So this is kind of his, his words. Uh, he gives this illustration. It says, the owner of a bank out of mercy and grace decides to set up a special account and deposit sufficient capital to pay all debts of every person who has ever lived on planet Earth. There's enough capital in the bank to pay mortgage, credit cards, department store, educational bills, auto loans, etc. The owner of the bank announces to everyone on the planet that there is enough capital in the bank to pay for all of their debts. However, there's a catch. Each individual must personally come to the bank and make the withdrawal. Whoever does not come to the bank will remain in debt. Now, I cannot repeat enough that the work that Jesus did in the camp and in the court is corporate. But the work that he does in the heavenly sanctuary is individual and personal. What has Jesus been doing in heaven for the last 2,000 years? Well, the answer is that he has been crediting his life and death to the account of those who come to him in repentance and faith, thus canceling their personal debt. Now, after Jesus lived, died, and resurrected on earth, he went to the holy place to apply to repentant individuals the benefits of his earthly works. Let's notice in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Jesus Christ, the righteous, my little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So does that make sense? So the, the perspective of what Jesus did on earth, he did in the camp and in court was corporate, was for everybody, right? And what Jesus is doing now um, in the sanctuary is for all of us individually, Okay, are we saved corporately? Are you saved because you're a part of a specific church? Are you saved because, um, well, your family believes, so that's good enough? You know, or is, are, we, are we seeing here um, that salvation requires a mutual, it's a mutual cooperation. It's uh, with, with Jesus as us individually. You know, we'll, we'll read through this where Paul later on writes, um, that we're to work out, each of us to work out our own salvation, right? So it's, you look, we encourage each other. We have to while we can. We fellowship together. We we sing together. We pray together. But make no mistake, salvation um, is, is individual, okay? It's a decision that we get to make here. Notice, uh, and by the way, you know that word advocate uh, is a special word there uh, that Paul read in 1 John uh, 2, 1. Uh, when you look it up, you know, what it means is a supporter, is someone who defends or pleads on behalf of another. You catch that? That is what Jesus is doing for all of us individually. He is supporting you, defending you, and pleading on your behalf. How amazing is that? And you know who he's pleading before? Oh, before the Father. And did you know the Father preordained us? to be his sons, to be his children, to be brethren with Jesus. You know, we, we talk about it all the time. It's like you got three votes for heaven, right? God says, yes. I mean, he created us to be with us. Satan says, no. So who's the deciding vote with? It's with me. 
Everybody who is in, who will be in heaven will be there because they decided and chose to be there. The people who are not there will not be there because they decided not to. Okay, let's read the text, Hebrews 7.25 now. Jesus intercedes only for those who come to God through him. Notice this. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who do what? Who come to God how? Through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's great news. Romans 8, verse 31 through 34. It's 30 through 33. It's 33 through 34. Thank you, diligent students. 33 through 34. Um, Jesus intercedes only for the elect. We'll talk about the elect in just a second. Uh, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? God justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Notice you see that constantly, right? We don't, sometimes we get too focused on just his death, right? And do we need to study it? We do. But we have to study his life. And we have to study his rest. And we have to study his resurrection. And we have to study intercession. Let's not separate any of that like we see um, happening and a lot of uh, our other um, churches of our brethren here. So he who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So who are the elect? Well, the elect are those who come to and accept Jesus as Savior and Lord in the context of the New Testament. Uh, you could see the word come and accept also as claimed and received. The elect are those who claimed and received Jesus as Savior and Lord in the context of the New Testament. The Bible does not teach that Jesus forgave all sins at the cross. Acts 2.38, the sins of individuals are forgiven when they repent and are baptized. Notice what Peter says. Then Peter said to them, repent and let how many? Every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So every one of you, that's an individual call. That's an individual altar call, if you will, that Peter is, is giving here. Let every one of you. So when our sins remitted, were they all forgiven at the cross? Notice the next text here with Acts 5.31. Jesus went to heaven to give repentance to Israel. Notice this. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. Why? To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness for sins. Was it important that Jesus went to heaven so that we could have forgiveness for our sins? A lot of this stuff may sound new, right? We kind of have the old, you know, Jesus died for my sins and I accept it and you know, look, there's, that's a good starting point. But the more we study, we see there's a lot more involved in this. Jesus has done a lot more than we think he has done in regards to our personal salvation. Notice the next page on the top of chapter 8, Acts 10, 43. And this is an individual condition here, okay? Acts chapter 10, verse 43. And it's talking about when individuals believe in Jesus God forgives their sins. This is a beautiful text. It says, To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever does what? Believes in him will receive remission of sins. So when do we receive? Well, when we believe in him. And that word believes a lot more than to just acknowledge that there is a God, right? The, the Greek meaning of the word often through the New Testament actually you know, refers to putting your whole trust into so like whoever believeth in him, what Paul was reading for uh, in John 3, 16, the text really could read that whosoever puts his whole trust in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it's a lot more qualifying than just saying, oh yeah, because you know, you, we'll read here that uh, does the um, does the devil believe that there's a God in the demons? Does that mean they're saved? You know, so it's talking about the trust and putting your faith into. Okay, let's continue on. So we'll notice in uh, first, 1 John 1, 9, that the sins of individuals are forgiven when they confess them. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Proverbs 28, 13, we notice that mercy comes when individuals confess and forsake sin. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Now, in Christ Object Lessons, page 311, it says, Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering, the robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every repenting, believing soul. And in The Faith I Live By, page 107, we notice that the grace of Christ is freely to justify the sinner without merit or claim on his part. Mm. Justification is a full, complete pardon of sin. The moment a sinner accepts Christ by faith, that moment he is pardoned. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to him, and he is no more to doubt God's forgiving grace. Oh, that's a that is a powerful statement. Um, if we've talked about it before, and I won't go off on it for more than a couple of seconds, but the study of of Jacob. Did Jacob live with guilt? For stealing his brother's birthright, never seeing his mom again. Twenty did did Jesus forgive him for what he had done? He remember he'd had that vision first uh, of the ladder and the angels were ascending and descending upon the ladder, and then twenty years later he wrestles uh, with the angel, you know, and he gets his name changed. But you know, for twenty years he lived with the feeling that God hadn't forgiven him, and uh, and he had. If you look at the blessing, the blessing was still the same, but but Jacob had. Um, changed in his uh, in his character, but very very important. We're no more to doubt God's forgiving grace. Forgiveness is not based on our feelings. That is very important, and that that helps us with guilt as well. Forgiveness is is based on what the Word of God says and what Jesus did for us, and us trusting in Jesus. If Jesus only forgave us when we felt forgiven, I'm not sure any of us would ever be forgiven. Right? It's not feelings based. We're forgiven because God says so on the condition that we accept Christ by faith, that we confess our sins. Um, the Proverbs 28, 13, Paul confesses and forsakes them. We'll have mercy. That word forsake is repent. The person who confesses and repents. So really good text. What about when the prodigal, when did the prodigal son receive the robe of righteousness from his father? When he repented? Uh, confessed his sin and trusted in the goodness of his father? Not all repentance and confession is genuine. During the holy place ministry of Jesus, the sincerity of repentance is not tested. You know you, you know uh, how your name is written in the book of life? Because you confess uh, that Jesus died for your sins, that he's the son of God. And, uh, you know, when does, um, when does the sincerity, when is it tested? When a person claims to repent and confess his sin, Jesus takes that person how? At his word. And he pours out the benefits of his atonement. But the judgment will reveal that the person was sincere and really entitled to the benefits. Notice this quote in Story of Redemption, page 386, where Jesus went to heaven to pour out the benefits of his atonement. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Is it because we deserved it? Uh, no. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? The rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances would no longer be received. Hey, highlight that. That'll be a key uh, sentence in our study the next few months, okay? The great sacrifice had been offered and had been accepted. And the Holy Spirit, which descended on the day of Pentecost, carried the minds of the disciples from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly where Jesus had entered by his own blood to shed upon his disciples, not the whole world, notice the words there, the, on his disciples, the benefits of his atonement. And what are his benefits? Well, his life, did he live the life we're supposed to live to show us how we're supposed to live it, that we could put on the robe of righteousness and his death? Did he die the death that we deserve? The judgment will reveal whether or not that person was entitled to the benefits. As the sins of the people were anciently transferred in figure 
to the earthly sanctuary by the blood of the sin offering. So our sins are in fact transferred where? To the heavenly sanctuary by the blood of Christ. Moreover, as the typical cleaning of the earthly was accomplished by the removal of the sins by which it had been polluted, so the actual cleansing of the heavenly is to be accomplished by the, remo by the removal or blotting out of the sins which are there recorded. The necessities and examination of the books of records to determine who, through repentance of sin and faith in Christ, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. And that's from The Faith I Live By, page 206. Um, where, where should your sins be right now? They're one of two places. Do you know that? They're either with you or you've confessed them and they've been transferred where? To heaven. So if they're not in heaven, they're with you. And if they're with us, how are we identified? We're identified as sin. When we put on the, the robe of righteousness that Christ has uh, um, weaved, has weaved a word, woven. Those words just get me every time. Weaved, woven, ro wove. Um, when we put that on, it's because we're trusting in Christ. We're putting our faith in Christ. We've confessed our sins and we've repented. And this is something we do daily, right? We got to check ourselves every time we get up. We got to check ourselves before we go to bed. But hey, we don't want our sins with us. Our sins go to, when we confess them and we repent of them, our sins go to heaven. We're going to talk about that in this lesson because we zero in a lot more in each uh, perspective and aspect of the sanctuary. So let's go to the most holy place on page nine. You guys with me? We're all right. We're doing all right on time, are we? We're kind of doing all right. We doing all right, Paul? <clears throat> Did I skip a page? No, we're good. All right. Um, the sinner was forgiven and cleansed in the holy place ministration, but the sanctuary was defiled. By the way, they would sprinkle the blood of the sin sacrifice on the veil. Think about that for a year, right? The day of atonement. Think of literal Israel sprinkling blood on the veil for a year. I don't know what that was like. There's a million people. I don't know what that was like um, in there, but did it need to be cleansed? It needed to be cleansed. The, the sanctuary was defiled. At some point, it was necessary for the sanctuary to be cleansed. And this happened in the most holy place on the day of atonement. Hebrews 9.23, you can read that in Daniel 8.14. We did a Daniel study. We have a playlist. You can check that out. We studied that uh, chapter verse by verse as well. How we know if a person is true was truly sorry for sin? Well, the change in the life reveals the genuineness of repentance. For this reason, the judgment is according to our works. We are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, but we will be judged by works because works reveal whether our faith was genuine. Does that make sense? You can read some texts here in Revelation 22, 12, Matthew 16, 27, Matthew 12, 36, and 37, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. That's the last verses of that book. The parable of the parables of Jesus in Matthew 24 and 25, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Hey, this is your study, right? You got to study these things out. Make notes on this. You probably have other verses that you could add on there. We want to know that. Put them in the chat. Only those who have claimed Jesus come and review in the pre-Advent investigative judgment before Jesus comes. You read that in 1 Peter 4, 17, right? Where does judgment begin? It begins at the house of the Lord. 1 Timothy 3, 15. At the second coming, Jesus will take the faithful to heaven, so their judgment must have taken place before he came. There is no urgency to judge the wicked before the second coming because they will remain on earth to be judged during the millennium. And that's uh, the latter part of the book of Revelation. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 310, she writes that it is while men are still dwelling upon the earth that the work of investigative judgment takes place in the courts where? Of heaven. The lives of all, yes, plural, were examined. His professed followers pass in review before God. All are examined according to the records of the books in, of heaven. And according to his deeds, the destiny of each is forever fixed. 
Yeah, I don't know about you, but I've I've heard the question, you know, before, you know, if God is all knowing, you know, know, knows everything, what does does God really need a judgment? You know, is that necessary? Well, the answer to that is no. God knows the true condition of all and does not need to be informed about who was truly repentant and who is not. The judgment is for the benefit of the universe, for us. There are true and counterfeit believers, and the universe must clearly see that God dealt faithfully with every case. Let's notice these bullet points. First, there is wheat and there are tares in the church. The casting of the gospel net gathers both good and bad fish into the church. The church is composed of wise and foolish virgins. In the wedding hall are guests who have the wedding garment and those who do not. Among those who claim to follow the Lord are those who say, Lord, Lord, but do not do his will. Even among the clergy, there are those who disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. And there are people who have a form of godliness without the power. Now, the Bible does not teach once forgiven, always forgiven. According to Ezekiel 33 and the story of the two debtors, if repentance is not genuine, it is possible that the judgment will revoke forgiveness. Okay, let's go back to the court now. Leviticus 16.7, the scapegoat ceremony took place in the court at the entrance of the holy place. Leviticus 16 provides the description of the scapegoat ceremony, which we will discuss again in another study at depth. People often ask the question, how can something as pure as heaven have a record of sin? The best way to answer this question is by asking another. How could Jesus bear the sins of the world on his body if he was holy? Sin does not belong to Jesus or to the sanctuary. Sin was imputed to them until it can be until it could be imputed to the one who is truly responsible for it. It's vitally important to realize that Jesus only placed forgiven sins on the scapegoat. The scapegoat did not forgive the sins of Israel. And you've got I think we might have time uh, Desmond Ford, I don't know if any of you heard of him before, but he claimed that the Day of Atonement took place at the cross because sacrifices were offered on the Day of Atonement. And it is true that the sacrificial aspect of the Day of Atonement took place at the cross, but this does not mean that the entire Day of Atonement ritual was fulfilled at the cross. Sacrifices were also offered on the Day of Pentecost. Does that mean the Day of Pentecost was fulfilled at the cross? The scapegoat did not forgive sins because without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin, Hebrews 9, 22. After the forgiven sins were placed on the scapegoat, it was sent to a non-inhabited wilderness, just as Satan will be exiled 1,000 years to a desolate world devoid of inhabitants. Now we'll move back out to the camp. After the millennium, the wicked will surround the camp of the saints. They will be destroyed and sin will be eradicated forever. The tabernacle of God will then be with men. He will dwell with them. He shall be their God and they shall be his people. Let's notice in Revelation 21 verses 2 through 4, it says, Then I, John, saw the holy city the new, Jer new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. You know what the ladder was that Jacob dreamed of? Jesus gives you the definition, uh, the last verse in John chapter 1. He says, um, you will see angels ascending and descending upon me. You know, Jesus is the ladder. You know what the sanctuary is? It's Jesus. It's the, it's the ladder uh, that connects us 
to heaven. Sanctuary is the gospel. Uh, uh, Pastor Rudy used to preach the gospel in a box. I don't know if any of you remember that. Who know Pastor Rudy uh, Vivanco? It's an explanation of how Jesus removes sin from the sinner. It's the plan of salvation. When you look at what took place in the camp, to the altar of sacrifice, to the labor that are in the courtyard, to the holy place where you have the candles, the, the lampstands, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the veil, the most holy place. That is the, the gospel. When we talk about the good news, what is the good news? That sin can be separated from the, from the sinner by a savior, right? It's the plan of salvation. How important is it for us to understand the sanctuary? Well, the sanctuary points to Jesus. One of my favorite uh, expressions that we'll see in this study is, especially when we uh, study the feast, uh, all of this uh, in types and shadows in the Old Testament is like a telescope. And when you look through the telescope, you see Jesus magnified. So as we go through this study, uh, for the next few months, um, I want you to notice um, how how it's rich with the story of Jesus, how it's rich with the plan of salvation, and what that means to us as individuals, because sin can be separated from the sinner, and this is how it's done. So this is kind of a, um, a short overview of what we're going to be studying over the next six to nine months. Um, we'll probably slow it down just a little bit on our next study. But uh, we want to encourage you to get the syllabus. Uh, you can, most of you on Zoom have my phone number and uh, Paul's information and ARM's information. Um, send us your questions or your comments. Put it in the chat. Communicate with us. Talk to us. You can text us during the week as well. Um, but I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, keep, keep, uh, keep your syllabus and your Bible handy. We're going to need it for next week. But I look forward to going on this journey with you guys. Um, as we learn more about Jesus, uh, you're going to see punctuality like you've never seen it before. If you want to see what on time is, uh, keep studying with us um, as we go through the Hebrew religious calendar. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, close with uh, prayer, Paul, and uh, we'll keep on with our Sabbath. Well, let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for life. We thank you for your love and mercy towards us. Father, we... Pray that you'll forgive us of our sins, creating us new hearts, new minds each and every day. Lord, draw us closer to you every minute, every hour. Father, we thank you for your great love towards us, for your desire to want us to be with you in heaven, Lord. Even though we are sinners, Lord, you gave us a way to get out of here, a way to be able to come home and to spend eternity with you, Lord. So we thank you for that. Father, we pray now for your blessings, your guidance, uh, and your protection of your angels and your Holy Spirit to be with us as we uh, enter into this Sabbath day, um, that you would guide us, protect us, be with our words, our thoughts, and our actions. We just pray that all we say and do would bring honor and glory to you. We thank you so much for all you do, again, for your love, your mercy, and your forgiveness towards us. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Happy Sabbath. God bless you. Hang out for a couple more minutes if you want to chat. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. God bless you.